very much. Uh, I, would, I would like to say, yes, well, it's a great honor for me to give a talk here for the Sunda Festa. And I also would like to thank uh, Sunda, Vijay, and others to, uh, for giving me this op opportunity of a uh, well, series of lectures, giving a series of lectures. And, uh, I hope it was okay for you. So, um, so my, the title of my talk is uh, Group Subgroup Subfactors Revisited. And the reason why this word revisited is that um, actually I worked on this subject in my master thesis. And uh, from time to time I, I came back to this subject. So that's why the reason of the word. That's the reason of the word. So, first of all, before going to mathematics. Can you see it? Okay. I, I put some Japanese word here. Oh, you read it. You can read it. Okay. <laughs> oh. So, this, this word, this is one word, is uh, in Japanese, so it means uh, 60th birthday. We have a particular word for 60th birthday. And it consists of two, two Chinese characters. And first character is a ring, means ring. So when, okay, in Japanese, von Neumann algebra is a von Neumann ring, a von Neumann kan, kan, it's, it's called kan, okay? And second letter is a reki, we say, so this is kan reki, and it means a calendar. So it's a, so to speak, ring calendar. But the real meaning is that, so in Japan, I think, it, well, actually in China, probably, so we have two, two way of counting numbers. In one way, the, the unit is 10, like everywhere in, in the world. So in one, one way, it's 10. The, the unit is 10, and in the other way, the unit is 12. So 60 is the smallest common multiple. So it means you, you came back. You came back to the original point. So yesterday, you came back to the original point. So today, you started the next circle of 60 years. Okay. And this is just a congratulation. And this is Sunda in Japanese. So happy birthday. Right. So I start with mathematics. So since Srinivasan already gave the definition of phonem algebra to one factor, so also let me go very quickly. So eight, all right. H is a Hilbert space, and uh, M is a subset of B of H. B of H is uh, the set of bounded operators on M, H. And then uh, a subset M is called the von Neumann algebra, okay? M satisfies the following three conditions. First of all, it's closed under star operation. So X star is a joint operator of X. And M is an algebra. And the natural operation of addition and the multiplication and so on. And it is closed in weak operator tuples. So this is the definition of a von Neumann algebra. Then a von Neumann algebra is called a factor if it's center. So this is center. Center of M is trivial, the complex numbers. And uh, then a factor M is of type 2, 1 if K. Okay, if it is an infinite dimensional, and there exists a so-called treasure state. So tau is a trace. We call it trace. And it is a linear functional satisfying this trace condition and this normalized, normalizing condition. So this is a two-one fact. But you've already saw it in Sunivas uh, talk. Okay. So we we think of a Actually, two sub two two one factors. So one n is a two one factor, and inside m, which is uh, again two one factor, we consider this situation. Then von Jones introduced a notion of index for two one factor. So namely, the index of n inside m is this number. It's a, well doesn't explain anything, but it's, so to speak, the relative dimension of m to n. Well, more precisely, so two one factor is a very nice, very nice notion of dimension. So every, say, n module, every n module, you know, for every n module, you can assign a nice 
dimension, so relative dimension, a positive number. So essentially, this okay, this number measures uh, how many n is contained in m as a left n module. So m is, m is a sub sub okay, sub algebra of m. So m is naturally so by left multiplication multiplication m is a left n module. So this is essentially counts the number of number of n contained in n. Then John shows the following uh, very striking result. So this number, okay, belong to well, either this discrete series set or continuous series. Okay. So, well, f you from the, just this definition, then you cannot, you never expect this kind of thing. But it's well, they, he showed it. So this is really a mysterious seven. But today. I, I'm not talking about this mysterious discrete series, but I'm talking about subfactors of integer index indices. So, namely, so I, I only talk about so-called group subgroup subfactors. So, R is a two-one factor. Throughout my talk, R is a two-one factor. If you like, you can assume that it's a hyperfinite to one factor. And Z is a finite group, and H is an H subgroup. Then we consider Z action on R. Okay? And let's assume it's R. Don't worry about this, this word. So it's, a, it's some technical condition. So assuring that cross product is again a factor. Now, given the Given an action, Z action alpha on R, you can construct what called a cross product. It's a, but as this. So, for G and H, then you can consider this pair, okay? The cross product of R by Z action and the R by H action. Then, the, the notion of index is such a natural thing that uh, you get this equation. So. The index of this group subgroup subfactor is the same as the index of H in G. Okay. So this shows that uh, this notion of index, John's notion of index is very natural. Right. So this is a group subgroup subgroup subfactor. So I concentrate on uh, this particular family, this particular you know, subfactor. So let me make one observation. So if there is a normal subgroup of Z, K, K, non-trivial, and it is contained in H, then so the group subgroup subfactor forget the information of K. Namely, it carries only the information of Z over K and H over K. So here P is a cross product of R by the K. Okay. So so the group subgroup subfactor will get the information of k. So let's make this assumption. Assume there is no such case. Okay, throughout my talk, I make this assumption. So this is not really a trivial fact, but it's a consequence of kind of, uh, say, a took homology vanishing in a non commutative sense. So let's make this assumption. Then the natural question is the following. Does the group subgroup subfactor uniquely recover the original pair? So does this remember the original pair? That's a very natural question. But a bit surprising. So the answer is no. And actually, the first counter example was provided by Sundar Mikodia in 2000. So in this paper, the subgroup subfactor, Okay. So they came up with this counter example, where the larger group G is a symmetric group of degree 4. Okay. So you, let's consider two subgroups. The first group H is a, the subgroup generated by this permutation. So it's isomorphic to that over for that. 
The next, uh, next, next group is this. So it's uh, the, the subgroup generated by this these two permutation. Then it's uh, isomorphic to z over 2 times z over 2. Then they show that these two pairs, so h in g and the k in g, give rise to the, the give rise to isomorphic subfactors. So, so this means that uh, you know, in general, the group subgroup subfactors cannot recover the original pair completely. And what they did is that they, so they computed so-called uh, connection. So they com well, there is a okay in a good situation there is a no uh, complete invariant for subfactors, namely the connection, Ockney's connection. So for this, then, then uh, for our group subgroup subfactors, there is a way to compute uh, connections by using a representation theory, and they compute. Then they show that okay for these two. So H and G and K and A, K and K and G give the same invariance. That they proved theorem. Actually, I wanted to ask you that how how you found this example? Which one is the example you gave? Yeah, this example. Yeah. The smallest example you can have. Okay. So yeah, yeah. It's the smallest example you can have. But how 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 did you find? It? <laughs> right. So when I saw this this result, I was a bit puzzled because before this result, I had an intent. I had an attempt to show that uh, group sub subfactor recovers original pair completely. Actually, I formulated an equivalent problem, but I couldn't solve the problem. Well, but, but it is natural. There is a counter example. So, so after this uh, result came up, so. I thought that there must be a very interesting algebra behind this phenomenon. And indeed, there was. So that's how well, I'm reporting today. <coughs> so before explaining the, well, actually, I completely characterized the uh, isomorphic group subgroup subfactors. So before explaining that result, I need to show you the, uh, the comp invariant for subfactor. So let's get back to the, uh, the general situation. So M and N are just a uh, in the finite index subfactor. Then starting from this, okay, you can think of uh, various bimodules. So let iota be a M as MN bimodule. So left multiplication of M and right multi multiplication of N. And let iota be a M as N, M by much, left multiplication of N and right multiplication of N. So these are fundamental bimodules. And study from iota and iota bar, you can form various tensor products over M or N. Okay. So namely, so you can think of a tensor product of iota and iota bar over N. Then it turns out that it's not uh, irreducible but it, be, it is decomposed into finitely many irreducible components. So you decompose it. Then again, you take tensor product with iota over n. Then it's, it's not irreducible. You decompose it. And you, so you, you do that procedure. So you consider every possible tensor product over either over n or m, starting from iota and iota. Then you get a, say, mn, 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 nm, and n. N by module. And this is not a really a tensor category because you cannot make a tensor product of, uh, say, M N by module and M N by module. But, it's, but if you choose the right legs, then uh, you can make tensor product. So it's a kind of tensor, tensor category. And uh, this category has two units, namely, so M as M N by modules and uh, N N as N N by modules. So it has two units. And this category gives a, well, in a nice situation, then this category gives a complete information of the subject. So, but uh, we, we need a more handy, handy invariance. So, anyway, 
it. So in this level, you put all the irreducible mm bimodal here. Okay. So in this example, you you have only three irreducible bimodal. And in this level, you put uh, all all the irreducible mn bimodal. In this example, you have only two. Then you draw you draw a graph. Namely, so if you take tensor product of rho, uh, rho and the iota of n, then it is decomposed into iota and kappa. So with multiplicity one. So in this example, you put just one line. According to the multiplicity, you put uh, lines lines here. Okay. In this way, and also starting from say kappa, you take tensor product with iota bar over n. Then it is decomposed into rho and alpha with multiplicity one. So you put one line here, one line here. So in this way, you can draw a, draw a group, graph. Okay? And this graph is so-called the induction and reduction graph. And uh, in fact, they are called the principal graphs. You do the same for the, here. So you put, uh, okay, in this level, you put all the irreducible element by modules. Then you draw, okay, induction and reduction graph. Then you get another graph. So in this way, starting from a subfactor, index finite subfactor, you get two graphs, two pairs of graphs, one here and the other here. And they are called uh, principal graphs of the inclusion subfactor. And uh, but okay, this notation, this notation is not a really popular notation, but so this this is just for today's purpose. But for some reason, I I want to use this particular graph, the graph for mn bimodules and nn bimodules, so let me call this g of, say, curly g, script g of m and n. So, in this particular example, then you get the same graph for g, g, the two, these two, and it's a so-called coxeta graph A5. So this, just, this is just a straight, straight line with five vertices. Right. So, so these graphs give you give you a very important information, although it, they are not completely invariant. So, let's get back to the group subgroup subfactor. So, when m and n are group subgroup subfactor, then for this part it's easy to. Actually, the, the structure of the graph is very easy. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, mm by module, irreducible mm by module, and uh, irreducible representation of z. And uh, similarly, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, mn by modules, irreducible mn by modules, and irreducible representation of h. And the principal graphs are really, this time it's uh, honest, restriction induction graph. Namely, starting from a representation of G, then you can restrict it to H. And you, you can decompose it to reduce it. Okay. In, the, in the similar way, starting from a representation of H, then you can induce it to the, the representation of Z. Then you can decompose it into reduce it. Then it turns out that the principal graph, one of the principal graph for this inclusion is here is this induction reduction graph. But uh, the other principal graph is a bit involved. Namely, it, it requires the double coset decomposition of Z. So this is a double coset decomposition of Z, and we use this for So G0 is just an identity. Okay? Then okay, we define a subgroup of H this way. Then it turns out that mn bimodules are parameterized by this disjoint union of the irreducible representation of hi. Okay. Again, the graph is given by the restriction induction here. So this part is just a disjoint union of the dual of hi. So let me show you a simple example. So this is a symmetric group of degree 3. H is a symmetric group of degree 2. Okay? So this is a double coset decomposition. So for one graph here, the graph for mn and mn, then you have this nice description 
of the induction and deduction. So it gives you the Cox theta graph A phi. And for the other graph, okay, so this uh, H1 is a trivial, trivial, so identity group. So the in induction deduction graph is just this part. So remember, so this part is uh, just a disjoint union of the dual of H hat and the uh, okay, dual of H and the dual of H1. Here, H is this, uh, okay. Okay, this is isomorphic to Z over to Z. Okay. So, since, uh, okay, this is just an additional copy of H hat, so you have this line and this one. So again, you get the Cox theta graph A phi in this example. Okay, this is a way to compute the principal graphs for a group subgroup subfactor. So, so now, so let's, so we have a group subgroup subfactor. Then as I explained, uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the irreducible MM binomials and the irreducible representation. But that, just, that is not only uh, just a one-to-one -one correspondence. It, give, it is uh, actually equivalence of uh, tensor categories. So MM binomials associated to this inclusion is equivalent to the representation category of G as a tensor category, abstract tensor category. So it means that if you have two pairs of groups, say H in G and H prime in G prime, then it means that the representation category of G is equivalent to the representation category of G prime. Okay. So if you know, uh, know something about, uh, say, duality theorem, Tanaka Klein duality theorem, or double equal robust duality theorem, you must think that, okay, then representation category completely recovers original group, so G must be isomorphic to G prime. You might think that, but it's not really true. To apply the Tan Tanaka Klein duality theorem, you need to fix this, you need to fix a, say, uh, how to say, okay, realization of, vector space realization of the representation category. But this equivalence is um, in the abstract level. You don't really fix the vector space realization, so-called the fiber function. You don't fix fiber function. And in fact, there is a nice characterization of um, this, this situation. It was found by, I think, of Geraki, Davidoff, and uh, my Kosak and myself in, independently. So you consider two groups, two finite groups, G and G prime. Then they have an equivalent representation category if and only if okay, the, the two groups are related in this by this situation. Well, I'll explain this in the next slide well, but roughly. So if you start from an abelian normal subgroup and the second cohomology element of, of the dual of A, yeah. and if this, okay, class is G invariant, then there is a way to deform this group G. And uh, okay, this situation is completely characterized by this relation. So, I'll explain it now. So, okay, start, let's start with the uh, finite group G. And let's consider uh, it's group out. It. Then it has a nice Hopper algebra structure. Then it has a coproduct, so called coproduct. Okay, antipole co inverse and uh, uh, co unit. So it is a Hopper algebra. And, uh, but this is a very special class of a Hopper algebra, namely, so the co product is co commutative. So you can, you can flip the tensor component, you get the same. And it's known that every co commutative, say, same simple Hopper algebra is given by a group algebra. It's well known there. Now, assume you are given a norm, Abelian normal subgroup and a cosite of A hat on A hat with coefficient in the torus group. 
and assume that the class, okay, cohomology class is Z invariant. So Z naturally acts on A, so it acts naturally acts on this cohomology class too. Assume the class is Z invariant. But you don't assume that the cocycle itself is a Z invariant. So remember, Z is a two variable function of A hat, okay? But the function algebra of A hat is nothing but the group algebra of A by duality. And since A is a subgroup of G, so the group algebra, algebra of A is embedded into the group algebra of G. So it means that you can regard omega as an invertible element of this tensor product. Okay, here. So this formula makes sense. In other words, you can twist the coproduct by using this cosine. But thanks to this condition, so G invariance condition, this new coproduct, actually, this, the, actually so cosine relations show that this is, a, again, a coproduct. And this invariance condition assures that actually this new coproduct is, again, co-commutative. So by the structure theorem of co-commutative Hopf algebra, so there must be a group, new group, such that okay, this Hopf algebra, so coproduct is twisted by omega, is isomorphic to the group algebra of G omega. There must be such a group. And actually, there is a precise description of this group. This group is not necessarily isomorphic to the original group, but it's very similar to the original group. It's an extension of G over A by A. Of course, G itself is an extension of G over A by A, but uh, so this could be a different extension. And the difference from the original extension is described by omega. Not omega itself, but starting from omega, there is some construction to produce cycle of G over A. Okay, so it's a different extension in general. So here is my characterization. So you consider two pairs of groups, okay, H in G and H prime in G prime. Then the two group subgroups are factors are isomorphic, if and only if the following conditions are satisfied. Namely, there is a unique, uh, this is a unique, uh, okay, Abelian's normal subgroup, and there is a non degenerate G invariant cosine, I mean, cohomology class. So the cohomology class of omega, okay, is G invariant, and moreover, there is a nice lift of the cohomology class such that this is trivial. The restriction of omega to this subgroup is trivial. Then, actually, it's not only this G omega, but also H omega. The deformation of H is, makes sense in this, under this assumption. And this happens if and only if, okay, the pair, pair H in G and H prime in G prime are related by this. So this is an if and only if. Okay. So it's a complete characterization. And again, so H, prime, H omega is similar to the original. H. It's an extension of H over H intersecting this by H intersecting this. But uh, it could be a different extension from the original extension. So this is a complete characterization of an isomorphic group, subgroup, subfactor. Here is one remark. So assume that the action of G over H is primitive, meaning that the H is maximal in this. So in this situation, then it's easy to show that there is no such pair, no such pair. So it shows that if you start with a group subgroup subfactor without any non-trivial intermediate subfactor, then this pair completely recovers the original group subgroup pair. So in a sense, so what, actually in an obvious sense, so the Cordillerum Sundar in its Cordillerum and Sundar example, the subgroup is very small, and which allowed this kind of phenomenon. So having a complete characterization in, in our fund, now it's easy to recover, reproduce Sundar and the Cordillerum example. So let's start with this Abelian group, okay? And we form a semi-direct product, okay? And consider this subgroup. So it's isomorphic to 
over to n and z over to n. Okay. So this, since this is an Arbarian group, so uh, by fixing a root of unity, then you can identify a and a hat, okay? And consider this cosine. Then this cosine to satisfy the previous condition. And you can compute the deformation of H by this cosine. Then it turns out that it's not isomorphic to the original. Okay. So you have it extra one here, and this is minus one. So when n is one, then it turns out that g and g omega are isomorphic to the symmetric group of the group four. And uh, one by definition h is isomorphic to z two plus z two. But so h omega is isomorphic to z over four z. So this we covered for the Sundar example. So when n is larger than one, strictly larger than one, then even the larger groups are not isomorphic. So this way, we get a series of, series of examples. So I have, a, I have a, just seven minutes. So let, at this point, I change my topic a little bit, and I talk about the Goldman antisymmetry. So let let me recall the classical Goldman theorem. So it's it's a sub subfactor result before von Jones. So at that time, there, is, there was no notion of uh, index, but uh, in modern time, so his result is stated in the following way. So it's a characterization of index to subfactor. Every subfactor of index two is given by the cross product by z. Right. So this is Goldman result. And there are several ways to generalize Goldman's type theorem. And one way to one way is to give a characterization of cross product, and that's well known. So that's well known, so I skip it. But uh, there's another way, namely the characterization of the group subgroup subfactor. Well, you cannot, it, it, you cannot do it in general, but there, there are some situations which allow uh, complete characterization of a group subgroup subfactor. So I'll talk about it. So let's consider the index three case. Okay, assume the index of n is three. Then there are only two possibilities. Then of the Cox, uh, principal graph, either a five or d four. When it is d four, then uh, by the characterization of uh, cross product, so the m is the cross product of n by uh, z over three z actions. So in my master thesis, I prove the following theorem. So assume that n is subtract and the principal graph is A5, then, okay, then this must be a group subgroup subfactor for this symmetry group pair. So I got this result in my thesis. So this is a nice situation which allows you to recover group subgroup subfactor. So, okay, so let me give you a definition of the word Goldman type theorem. So we say that the Goldman type theorem for uh, theorem holds for this pair if, okay, whenever you have a subfactor whose pr principal graph is isomorphic to this group subgroup subfactor, the principal graph of the group subgroup subfactor, then so they are actually a group, group subgroup subfactor. So this is uh, what I mean by Goldman type theorem. So this means that uh, Goldman, a Goldman type theorem holds for this pair. S2 inside S3. Okay. Then uh, Holman Zimanski gave a Goldman type theorem for in 96. Actually, they, in their case, the groups, the bigger group is a dihedral group over all that for n plus 2, and the smaller group is z over 2z. It's not normal. So Holman Zimanski got this nice Goldman type theorem, and also Holman got this Goldman type theorem. So, actually, they, when I saw their result, I realized that they, actually, they, they got a really nice argument. It's fairly better than mine, my proof here. And I look for a bunch of, I look for graphs which allow a similar characterization, and I found this, this example. So, let's assume that the graph is 2, two to the n graph. 
family. So there is a one point at the middle. Then there are, there are n legs of length too. So for example, this is two, 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 two graph. Okay. Assume the principal graph is two to the n. Then the, something surprising happens. So n must be here. n must be the prime power minus one. And uh, actually, so the the subfactor is a group subgroup subfactor of this particular pair. So this is a finite field of uh, degree of uh, with uh, p to the a element. So you can you regard this as an additive group. Then the multiplic multiplicative group of the field acts on it naturally. Turn out that this graph completely characterizes this pair. So for example, in this case, the graph is two 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 two. Then so the subfactor is obtained by this this pair. Okay. So this is the first infinite series which allows group subgroup subfactor. And I use we use this result for the complete classification of index five subfactors. So this is with uh, Scott Morrison and uh, Noah Snyder. So assume the index of n is five and finite depth. Then so this essentially so this subfactor is a group sub group subfactor. Or oh, it's dual. There is a notion of dual inclusion. So, and all possible pairs of graph, uh, groups are the following. So, cross product like that five. And this is, actually this case is covered by Hon, uh, Hon Zimanski. And this is covered by the, my result. And there are two more cases. Alternating group case and a symmetric group case. And to prove this theorem, I need to show, I need to show a Goldman type theorem for this pair. I mean, this alternating proof pair. So namely, the principal graph for this group, subgroup subfactor is so-called 3, 3, 3, 1 graph. There's a one vertex here, and the length, the three legs of length three, and there are one leg of length one. So it's 3, 3, 3, 1 graph. So I had to show a Goldman type theorem for this pair, but I generalized a little bit, then I got the following. So assume that the principal graph is 3 to the n1. Okay. Then again, you have a great restriction. n must be a prime power minus 1. And the subfactor is actually a group, sub, group, sub, group subfactor. And this time, the pair h and g are the following. So the larger group is uh, this projective general linear group over the finite field. And h is this diagonal okay, subgroup, uh, upper diagonal subgroup. I think, uh, well, my time is up, so I think I'll stop here. Asymmetric group two. Because you, you illustrated for n equal to two and then uh, n equal to four. And yeah, yeah. Just just before this, you had that. Oh yeah, so before I this. Is. Actually, I yeah, I also have a Goldman type seven and for S. S three contains S two. Oh S. Okay. S plus one contains S n. S three S four case. Then uh, it gives you the. Uh, um, Okay, so-called extended E7. And again, you have a Goldman type cell for that. 